So, as a disclaimer, right? I know I am scatterbrained. Remember when I talked about the upper respiratory versus the lower respiratory, and we said that the upper is the nares, the nasal cavity. All right, the nasopharynx. And I said, well, I can't talk about this and not talk about, well, that the maxilla and the palatine bones make up the hard palate, and the hard palate is the, the, the floor of the nasal cavity and the roof of the oral cavity. And the oral cavity leads into the oral pharynx, and the nasal pharynx leads into the oral pharynx, and the oral pharynx leads into the laryngo pharynx, and the laryngo pharynx. Then you have to decide. Well, there we have what the epiglottis, and the epiglottis underneath it is your larynx, and so your larynx gets pulled up in the gag reflex. Your uvula of your soft palate, uvula, uvula, you got the gag reflex. This guy's hooked up with cranial nerve nine as sensory, sends it back to the brain. Brain comes back with motor, which is cranial nerve 10, vagus. And but what that'll do is it'll stimulate the constrictor muscles of the trachea to pull the larynx up to the epiglottis so that as the food bolus passes hitting the uvula, it doesn't go into the larynx, it goes into the esophagus. And, and at, the eso at that junction, we have a lax sphincter that's referred to as the upper esophageal Sphincter. Any questions so far? Just review. From yesterday. I mean from last class. So when I go into the esophagus, remember from esophagus down, that tube has layers. Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and externa. Everybody agree? Or serosa. Right? And the esophagus, its job is to conduct food bolus from oral pharynx, laryngeal pharynx, to the stomach. And then the stomach, sure enough, we have two, two more sphincters. So we have this sphincter here is the lower. If I have an upper, I must have a lower esophageal sphincter. So I went to the side note. I went to the orthopedic surgeon yesterday. He tells me exactly what I already knew. That my right knee is jacked up and I gotta get surgery. More so than my left knee, but both of them gotta be done. He doesn't want to do both at the same time, so I'm gonna have to do one, each one separately. My right knee has both the anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament gone. Need to be repaired. So you have it gone? I mean, no, I gotta get fixed, but I have to schedule the, the surgery. So that's the next step. So if you guys at some point see me this semester in, in, uh, in a, not in a wheelchair, but in a, you know, with crutches and whatnot, that's the reason why. It's a same day operation. So I wanna get it done as soon as possible because my, all my cartilages are still intact. If I wait, much longer, I could develop osteoarthritis. And then, you know, so I've been blessed. My ligaments have been tearing, but my joints, cartilage is intact. So it means no osteoarthritis as long as I can keep the joint stable. And it was really cool because going there and I told the guy, so it was an African-American doctor, Dr. Wilkinson, phenomenal doctor, phenomenal displeasure, he's amazing. I mean, really a personal guy, you can tell, really personable. Um, I was like, what do you want to do? He's like, Doc, seriously, I want to get this operated on. I don't want it to get worse. And he looked at me and he's like, mm -hmm, I agree. 
Because he was like, yeah, we can brace it. Like, Doc, I've been bracing this for years. I can't keep bracing it. I, I could wake up tomorrow and suddenly start getting osteoarthritic changes. I don't wait too long. So, he oh, what, what is the problem? You sit there home. Yeah, my, both of my cruciate ligaments are gone. So what happens is when I walk, I feel like I told him. I said, because I'm an anatomy physiology professor, I said, I'll give you the, the, the proper description as I know it to be. My femur is slipping on my tibial plateau. I, I feel it because there's nothing to keep it from sliding. It's There's stuff still keeping it from doing like this, but what's happening here? And so he had me sit at the edge of the table. And, I'm, and then he says, if you can, if you can, and I, so I, I couldn't do it. He had me sit on the table with my legs slid forward a little bit like this. Damn, that was, my pants were dirty. <laughs> the damn dog. So you put your feet like this and you have your feet just underneath and you're supposed to contract this, the, 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 this muscle with your feet flat on the floor. And I couldn't do it. When you do that, you'll see this, you'll see the, if the cruciate ligaments, you'll see this play in the knee. At the tibia, so when I got home, I was I was, all, I was upset because I was like, "Oh my gosh, man, I'm all jacked up! Like I can't elicit muscle responses from these muscles. Like what the hell is going on with me?" So I sit there. I'm sitting there for like hours trying to stimulate my muscles to work. So I, when I call the doctor, they I say, "Ah, I got it to work, doc. I got it to work." <laughs> but sure enough, I did it, and I could feel the play. So if you sit and then you and then the, and then you squeeze this muscle, you'll see that it'll move, and it's not supposed to move. So that's one way of doing it. The real way of doing it is you put the patient up on the on the on the bed with the legs flexed, and then you take and stabilize the, the femur and the hip. Take the other hand to the tibia, and then you pull it a couple times. If it pulls forward, then it means your PCL is back. If you push it back, it means your ACL is back. So when he did my right one. Uh, yeah, you got to play everywhere, like forward, backward. So yeah, that's. So if you guys see me in crutches, that's what's going on. All right. And that's crutches for the next year. Yes. So back in the day when they, oh, can it? Like if it gets worse? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely, you can get the, the whole. Like I'm lucky. My knee could be like super swollen right now. It's not. I have no swelling at all. No inflammation. It's just the mechanical aspect that I sense, that I feel when I put my body through that, that stress of either going up or downstairs. I can feel it. When I go to lean over and grab something, pain is excruciating. So I avoid it. So, again, that's, you know, but just so, so you guys know. All right. So laryngopharynx leads the larynx, leads the suffies. So the lining of the oral pharynx, the lining of the oral cavity, the lining of the laryngopharynx, and the top of the epiglottis is consistent with the esophagus. When you get to stomach, everything changes. The epithelial lining changes. The mucosal lining changes. Did everybody hear me? Because remember we said that the digestive tube has a mucosa, a submucosa, a muscularis, Uh, muscular, sorry, muscularis, and that's propria, what they call propria or externa, and then the serosa or adventitia. Okay? Any questions? That's the two. Now, remember that the mucosa contains an epithelial lining with a basement membrane, some connective tissue. And a smooth, a single smooth layer, so a single smooth muscle layer referred to as the muscularis mucosa. The muscularis mucosa, guys, is what's going to aid us in flipping that basement membrane up. Well, in the gastric, in the stomach, it's taking your basement membrane and it's doing what? Down. And because you take the, pull the basement membrane down because the muscle's underneath, then I can do what? I can populate the cells on the basement membrane and now I make my gastric pits. They already got me? But when I get to when I get from stomach to duodenum, right? One, 
I got this really well designed pyloric sphincter, which is tighter than your anus. Literally. Literally tighter than your anus. Why would it be tighter than your anus? Because the stomach, what do we say, is dripping hydrogen ion concentrations constantly. You know agree? And it'll burn the duodenum. So you better you better pucker up and keep and keep shut. Because if you leak out, then you're requiring the duodenum to respond. Yes. Is there a cardiac um, sphincter on the stomach? I like the two ends. The cardiac. Oh. The lower esophageal sphincter. It's in the cardiac region. Oh. But it's referred to as the lower esophageal oh. sphincter. Another clinical disease. My cousin. You know, he died. My grandfather. You know, he's dead, right? So. Stomach, excess acid, my grandfather, Tums, regularly, hiding it, little Rolaids, hiding it, sticking it in, a, in all different places so he, anytime he wanted it, huh, he'd drop it. Instead of going to the doctors and saying, hey, I got acid reflux. Wasn't overweight, had hypertension, but didn't have any other issues. His stomach lining was burned away. He got ulcers, continued to ignore it, continued to take the Rolaids, continued to take the Tums. Guys, what's Rolaids and Tums? Let me write it over here, ready? Rolaids and Tums. They're calcium bicarbonate. So for every one of these, you got two of these. They're calcium bicarbonate. Or, I apologize, they're calcium carbonate. They can be that too. So they can be this. Calcium carbonate or calcium bicarb. Okay? And I apologize, this should then be a two up. So it's either one of the two. And what happens? Well, bicarbonate, we said, is the body's main buffer, yes? And, the, and, and so when you take this stuff regularly in the stomach, what are you doing? You're bringing the acid, con the acid hydrogen ion concentration up. You're bringing the pH up from low to high. There it is. So the pH in the stomach, I'm gonna write it here, stomach, pH is low, low, two to three pH of two to three, that is highly acidic. How do we prevent from digesting our own lining of our stomach? Through constant mucus secretion, and guess what, the gastric, the gastric pits, guys, the cells of the gastric pits, they're moving upward along the basement membrane. So as they get further out to the edge, they get sloughed off and replaced. Did everybody hear me? So the ones down below are growing outward and they're replacing the ones that are out there already exposed to the environment. So you need a constant replenishing of these cells. Separately, large amounts of mucus that have large amounts of bicarbonate in it. Make sense? Hmm? But the inside of the lining, the inside lumen of the stomach needs to have a pH of 2.3 but the lining needs to be at a neutral pH. You ever understand? If you take, so, roll aids and tums, what are they doing? They're bringing the pH up to normal. That increases your risk for he helicopylora bacteria. So when you take these roll aids and stuff, you're increasing your risk for a bacterial infection that's gonna cause ulcerations. Same thing as the proton pump inhibitor. Separately, anti-inflammatory drugs can reduce the cell replacement. And if I reduce my cell replacement, then I'm at any increased risk for ulcers. Separately, pain meds reduce Secretions. Right here, see what's going on? 
And what did I tell you? 50% of the time we do more? Not harm. Harm than good? Hey, It's not a lie. It's the truth. It's just a matter of whether or not we want to recognize it and whether or not we want to actually do something besides what everybody else, what the status quo is doing, which is doing more harm than good. And then they just document it. <laughs> so this is why, guys, this is why we have to educate our patients. And for you to educate your patients, you what? You got to be educated. You got to be informed, yeah? You can't inform a patient if you're not informed. Everyone agree? Man, there's just so much stuff that could play a role in that, that pH balance and that mucus lining in the stomach. And not only that, the duodenum. Everyone understand? Because as much as the stomach needs it, guess what? So does the duodenum. Because the duodenum is the first person, the first structure to receive whatever the stomach is going to kick dish out. The good thing is that the duodenum has what? A feedback inhibition to stomach, doesn't it? It can tell the duodenum, hey, give me some. And then when it's got it, hey, stop. That's a negative feedback inhibition. Everybody hear me? Sure enough, the hormone's called secretin that stimulates. And the one that stops it is what? Anybody know? Gastric inhibitory peptide, GIP. Gastric inhibitory peptide, GIP. Who's going to inhibit the stomach? The esophagus? The large intestine? The rectum? The duodenum. Everybody understand it? The duodenum. So the duodenum can inhibit through gastric inhibitory peptide. Jip. Jip. Jip, 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 jip. All right? Back in the day, we used to say jip, man. You jip me. It means you robbed me. You stole my money. Slang. Kids don't lose that slang no more, do they? You know. So, guys, you see why it's important to understand this stuff. Because there's clinical sense to this. There's a clinical. What's your test? Next Thursday? 13. All right, so another two weeks. We got plenty of time. <laughs> we got plenty of time. So now, so I did go into the GI, but my but notice now what I was really focusing on was well what was upper? Well upper stops. Upper respiratory stops right there, right at where the epiglottis is. So above the epiglottis. Upper respiratory tract infection. Did everybody hear me? Below the epiglottis, lower respiratory tract infection. You got me? Now, the lower respiratory tract infection has what? It's got the, the RZ, the respiratory zone, and the CZ. The conduct, the, sorry. I should do it the proper way. Conduction zone versus respiratory zone. Because the respiratory zone starts where the conduction zone ends. Yes? Terminal bronchioles, so trachea, primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, terminal bronchioles, conduction zone. Alveolar, um, uh, sorry, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, alveoli, respiratory zone. Everybody got me? All part of the lower respiratory tract. Got me? So, and why am I doing GI? Because respiratory really is what? The cute little bud off of the primitive GI tube. Everyone agree? And it becomes this complex structure. Not ever actually working. <laughs> until that first day that you're born you take that first breath <sighs> that traumatic event of having been expelled from that nice warm nurturing environment right if I could only stay there forever it's all good right because I'll be around for another 30 years all right so 
anti-inflammatory drugs, pain meds, proton pump inhibitors, roll aids, tongues, hey. acids, excess acids that one would consume in the form of aspirin, which is what? A combination of pain med and inflammatory drug? Ah, uh -huh. ever see? So should I be taking aspirin regularly in large doses? No. Should I be taking it regularly in small doses? Wait. If I have a heart problem, man, and, and I'm over 55, over 55, it doesn't matter if you're overweight, if you're over 55, because poor circulation increased risk for coagulation. You understand? So low dose aspirin, that's called baby aspirin. Now even then, they're recommending to not take it every day, to take it every other day, huh? Because even at the small doses, baby, baby aspirin at small doses can, can, from, can lower the pH even more. Does that sound good? For longer, does that sound good? No, increase your risk for gastric erosions. It, does, that, does that make so sense, guys? It's, it's better to just deal with the uh, bird or whatever. No, it's change your eating habits. <laughs> but look, I get it. I get it. If I, yeah, you don't look like you have I, problems with your eating habits. No, because like when I get uh, horizontal. Yes. So I'll go, I'll eat, and then I'll go do activities. Like I'll go snorkeling, yes. I'll go surfing. Yeah. I always get it. You get it when you're scooping. You know what? Yeah, you be careful because if, you, if you're eating and go snorkeling, you give yourself at least two, three hours before you digest because then you definitely get that sometimes as a reflux. Yeah, you should, you should be doing that then. That's the thing, baby. <laughs> it, 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 be surprised how many times when you sit down and you look at the triggers involved. Most cases, it'll be either they're eating and they're going and lying down, or they're eating and they're doing some kind of activity that's causing this rebirth. So what you've got to do is you've got to link the behavior to the symptoms for you to connect the dots and realize, oh, I need to change the behavior to avoid the symptoms. So just don't eat. Don't eat before you do those things that you know you're going to be vertical. You know, eat after. Um, or eat er much earlier so that way you're giving your body time to digest it. Because it's going to take 2 to 12 hours or... It'll take your stomach that said like so that six it'll, hours sometimes. Right? Yeah, so it take it'll take time to go through and then and then, so between twelve to twenty four hours is usually what it takes to get through wow. the entire GI system, but protein takes longer. And so in most cases, to be honest with you, like you go and dive in the morning or in the evening? So you in the morning? Yeah. So you eat breakfast in the morning, I assume. Try to eat yeah. No, so what I've been doing is just not eating. Not eating. Yeah. So get up early and eat breakfast early. See if that works. Just eat yeah. a little, not. Yeah, don't eat a big dinner. Carb up. You you could, but then you gotta be careful because then if you're not active at night, then then then, yeah. then it'll start <laughs> stacking up on you day by day. <laughs> so you got you gotta be really careful. You have to be conscientious of what you're eating, how much you're eating. You could maybe you could make smaller meals that have the same that have the same caloric value, right? You could do smoothies. And then um, just eat smaller meals more frequently throughout the day. That 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 may help uh, remove it. Again, what happens? Most people don't want to do this, guys, because it's a lot of work. They want a magic pill that I don't fucking have. <laughs> do you understand? <laughs> like, people want this magic pill. Like, yeah, sorry, I don't have a magic pill for you. Like, you know what the magic pill is? Like exercise and eat right and learn what triggers your symptoms and then change them. There is no magic pill, I'm sorry. Now I can give you what you may think is a magic pill, but I know that it's not. So I gotta tell you, it's not a magic pill. Some people come in high cholesterol. They want the magic pill. What am I gonna tell them? No, I give you three months. You better come back with something, otherwise you're gonna find yourself a new doctor. That's what I'm telling you. I'm not playing. You come to me with high cholesterol, I'm telling you, you better get on a, on a strict regimen, You got and you got hypertension, you better get off that salt. You think I'm joking. Typical Puerto Rican, eating all that fat, pig, right? All right? And Cubans, same way, same boat. Dominicans, igualito. I'm picking it all of y'all, I'm picking it all of y'all. Like, man, we eat so poorly. And then they wonder why. They eat fry, 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 fries, and they wonder why they get a digestion. Hello? Fatty acids. 
inside the stomach stimulate the stomach to secrete more acid. You see? So, hey, you got acid? I'm not picking on you now because you don't look like somebody who eats a lot of fried stuff. I'm not allowed to fry stuff. See? See? <laughs> but, but here's what happens. Hey, you fry stuff, even if it's fish. <laughs> you fry. <laughs> even if it's fish that you fry. Just a little bit. Of that fry, fry is bad. It's bad. The fatty acids, they're bad. They're not good. And sure enough, people will... They'll still eat it. Wow, but I love it. <laughs> hey, really? Would you, would you, would you love the, the coconut oil is a little better? Hey, would you love to get the stomach acid? Would you love to get that excess stomach acid and then get the ulcerations? And then get the stomach cancer? And then the stomach cancer move to the liver? And then get stage four liver disease? And have it for like 10 years? Because you've been ignoring it, right? Because this is what happened to my grandfather. He ignored it. He took roll aids and tons directly and ignored it. And it went from ulcerations to stomach cancer, from stomach cancer and went to the liver. Why? Because the stomach, the spleen, and the GI all drain to the liver. Hepatic portal system. Where else was it going to go? <laughs> That's its design. So you see why you don't want stomach ulcerations? You see why you don't want duodenal ulcerations? You see why you don't want jejunal ulcerations? You see why you don't want ileal ulcerations? What do we call that? Ulcerative colitis. That's what they call it. Another disease. So we're talking about what? GERD. We're talking about excess pump, proton pump, right? So we're talking about people who have GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. My cousin had this for 30 years. He died. Because why? Because if that acid increases... So if the acid concentration increases and the pH drops, and it's consistently that way, and I told you that the pyloric sphincter is is closed tighter than the than the wall at at um where what is it um the place that we still are Fort Knox right it's, it's tighter than Fort Knox. So if I got excess acid, guys, where's it going? It's going this way or going that way? If you're normal, it's going what? It's going back up because that's laxed. It's always semi laxed. That's even more lax. This one's always closed. So what's it gonna do? Every time you go and you eat, and then you go, you go horizontal. It's moving. The acid's moving from the stomach to the esophagus. Is the esophagus supposed to get hydrogen ion concentrations? No. Do you think the esophagus has the mechanisms by which to combat? No, because it wasn't designed for that. Does that make sense? So what do we get? A change in the lining of the esophagus. That's called Barrett's esophagus. Everybody hear me? And that leads to a couple things. Well, one, it leads to a change in the mucosa. Two, it leads to a weakening of the submucosa and the muscularis propria. And in there, we got blood vessels. Everybody understand? Does everybody understand that? So excess acid will lead to erosion of the GI of the esophagus, especially the lower part of the esophagus. And it'll lead to Barrett's esophagus, which can lead to... Blood leaking into what? Into my esophagus. And then what? <clears throat> Not when you cough up, but when you spit. You spit up blood. They call that what? Hema? They're spitting up blood or they're throwing it up? Everybody hear me? They're throwing up blood. Spit up or throw up blood? Hematesis. Hematesis. Different. <coughs> blood. Hemoptysis. Spitting up of blood when you cough is different than spitting up blood when you vomit or throw up or spit up. You understand, guys? One is telling you you got a leak in the GI. The other one's telling you you got a leak in the respiratory. Okay, you got me? One is telling you you got something wrong. Either you got heart failure 
If you're coughing up blood, you either got heart failure and blood is accumulating in the lung and it's got nowhere to go. So you 